about what the shape um, and structure of ChangeWorks coaching would be um, as we're, we're kind of thinking it all out. Now, again, I kind of realize that everyone has their own special ways of doing things, and I'm not going to say that people can't do those sorts of things. I would just like to think that if they are getting a client um, as a result of change works that we try to deliver an experience that is consistent regardless of which of the professionals is delivering it. So it doesn't have to be exact, but I'd like to think that structurally these same elements are still going to be present, assuming these elements are appropriate for uh, whatever you end up doing with that, with that individual. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I think if you guys put yourself in our position as well, if we're out there marketing this thing called the change work system, that we need to have some system <laughs> uh, other than the other than the program online. So, uh, yeah, anyway, there you go. All right. So last time around, we talked about white, uh, green, black. So current situation, desired situation, obstacles. I will tell you, as time goes on, I'm becoming less and less connected to the graphic the whole idea about footprints and, and all that. I mean, I like that it resonates with the concept of a path of self-discovery. So I'm kind of okay with it, but I more and more I find myself talking about the, uh, the descriptor rather than the image itself. Uh, and one of our more contemporary programs on the path, we simply used ovals. So anyway, there you go. This is obviously, how old is this handout? 1984, there you go. Although I don't remember, Linda, in 1984. Oh, I hadn't met you yet. Right. I didn't I didn't meet Linda until 1989. Is that right, dear? I, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, this has been around for a very long time. Um, okay. So, um, 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 uh, I want to pick up where we left off on obstacles. I think I'd given you guys a little hint that said that, you know, if you want to keep things nice and short and tight, you could just say, so what's stopping you from getting there? And whatever the people end up saying is, you know, you might want to explore it in more detail and that's that. And you might say something like, well, what else is in your way? What else is in your way? You know, just kind of get some dialogue going so you can extract whatever obstacles, real or imagined, are, are there to be dealt with. But if you really want to do a thorough dive into it, so over here in this invisible space, this is where the more in-depth uh, kind of uh, path work would happen here. Um, we said we would explore the obstacles um, as they fall into four categories. So what were the four categories of obstacles we might encounter? Hmm. The unable. Unable, yep, yeah, the four uns. Unwilling, unsuitable. Unwilling, unsuitable. Uh, unaware, unable. Unaware. Unsuitable, right. right, 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 right. So the four uns. Now, I could go even deeper and say that the four uns, um, hmm, wait, I was about to, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I feel good about what I'm going to say, that I believe that a thorough um, walk through those four uns is going to end up extracting both obstacles of, uh, you know, in fact, and obstacles of the mind, as opposed to having to do that unaware, unable, unwilling, unsuitable thing um, for both obstacles in reality and obstacles of the mind. Um, in fact, without going to a deeper dive into it, where do you think the obstacles of the mind start to come into unaware, unable, unwilling, unsuitable? Which of those would you think are probably going to be populated more with obstacles of reality, obstacles in fact, versus obstacles of the mind? Anyone have thoughts about that? Unaware? What do you think for unaware? Obstacles of the mind or obstacles of fact? I think unaware. Uh, uh, that's obstacle of the mind? That's what I would say. Obstacles of the mind, yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be both. Um, but certainly it starts off as an, uh, as an obstacle of the mind because the mind is, is either empty or ignorant of something. It may very well be that they are unaware of an actual physical obstacle that's in their way. Um, and so, uh, so fine, you'll deal with it as an obstacle of reality, practicality, but it came to you as an obstacle of the mind. Does that feel uh, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that feels right to me. But I'm thinking like, again, from a healthcare perspective, attention, you know, pain, inflammation, those things get your attention. The awareness should take you to the point where you're like, I need to go check this out, especially when it's consistent. And that doesn't always happen. You know, mm -hmm. by the time they actually come to the doctor, like, how long have you been experiencing this? Oh, it's been months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, something that's been getting their attention for months, but the awareness again says, like, you know, this. Yeah, they this... didn't hit. Yeah, they didn't have enough awareness to hit a threshold, right? To do something about it. So, yeah, that's <clears throat> an interesting point. Um, trying to think if there's kind of an opposite things when it comes to obstacles of the mind. Might it be true that people? are aware that's in air quotes of things that really aren't in any way <laughs> truth or fact or really an obstacle at all. So, I mean, sometimes I think that people come into it with a predisposed mindset, of strongly held beliefs about something that may not be evidenced in fact. So, you know, yeah. or in fact, yeah. So I would say that's true, especially when it comes to the mind. Because remember, when you're talking about the executive function of uh, the cortex is very focused, is very limited in information in terms of what it's going to focus on at any given point in time. Mm -hmm. That's why people, when they're experiencing psychedelics, it desensitizes like default mode networking. So opens up all these different opportunities that perhaps are lying dormant. That's mm -hmm. what people experience kind of like this aha like wow okay yeah but it probably was there all along probably well exactly and so when we when we uh, talk about what could be present um that they are unaware of is wrong i guess that's the bottom line they they hold mm -hmm. something to be true that is in fact wrong they're unaware of how wrong they are <laughs> you know they're unaware of how i don't know whatever words to put to it outdated their information or uh, that, but I think this is where we would probably say the country and still expect, still display that, but it doesn't well, true. change things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. So I'm kind of wondering if this is are people hmm, they're unaware of their biases, they're unaware of the logical fallacies that they they might be um, under the spell of. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to have a, a polite way to say that this other than, well, you're unaware of the fact that you're wrong and stupid. So, you know, I mean, you don't, this does not help <laughs> client relationships, but that's the bottom line. You know, they're either being, they're either hold something that is just plain wrong um, and they're holding on to it dearly. Like they've got some real emotional connection to it. That's where it starts feeling like a bias. Mm -hmm. um, and then the logical, uh, we talked about the logical fallacies. So how they go about believing that X is true um, is definitely affected by that as well. So that's what I guess I'm saying is they, they are unaware of the biases. Now that gets to, oh, Tim, you're on the call. So when you're doing your work with the DEI um, sorts of stuff, how often are, is the awareness issue really not, that they are unaware of how mistaken they are or how biased they are or whatever. Pretty often. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think I mentioned on a prior call, um, part of the challenge there is that whatever awareness they have is connected to their value and belief system. Mm -hmm. so what you're trying to do at that point is really you're challenging their values and belief system. And they may not always be aware of why they believe what they believe. They just mm. know that's what they believe. And um, they were taught that uh, either by folks that they love and respect or worked with. Right. Uh, and trying to get that changed uh, is a huge lift. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. It's kind of been, it's part of their engrams now, you know, it's part of their yeah. very yeah. Yeah. program. Yeah. And it doesn't you know, necessarily be something that's intentional. I mean, if we just are exposed to something frequently enough for a long enough period of time, we come to believe that it is, you know, consistent, therefore reliable, therefore true. And it may not be at all. 
It's just yeah. based on these filters we're looking at the world through. So It's a conditioning. I remember when I first came to the United States meeting John Lewis and Cory Booker uh, was a young aspiring uh, uh, activist at the time, but John Lewis was doing the reenactment. It was at, on the Harvard campus, and they were doing a reenactment of Plessy versus Ferguson. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, a white man that I met, became friends with, and he was part of, back in the civil rights days, a student nonviolent coordinated committee. They call it SNCC. And he told the story how his father was a Klansman, and they used to go to church, and then after church, they would go home and in the back of this station wagon was this uh, chest and his father would take out the chest after church and put on the rope. And that's what he was just conditioned to think like it was, it was okay. Hmm. But at some time over time, he started to experience and uh, interacting with uh, non-whites and that became a teaching ground for him to test out some of these biases uh, that he had, and then he got involved with the student nonviolent coordinated committee. It was a fascinating story to hear, but he it, it said it was just conditioning. That's all he knew yep. until he was, right. you know, challenged otherwise. Right. Yep. So much of the time, we're just replicating what was modeled for us. We were growing mm -hmm. up in that. So, well, um, so it sounds like when we're talking about unaware, there may be the uh, an, an unawareness of some real practical concrete thing that and one of the things I'm thinking about is like a lot of people that are out there trying to start businesses or whatever may not be aware of the fact that they have to have a business license or whatever it is so they just didn't know that this was something that is there so it's more of a physical concrete real sort of an obstacle that has to be overcome but it sounds like a great many of the obstacles of the mind um, may very well be uh, in the unaware category. So unaware of biases, unaware of uh, how beliefs and values are really more exercises in eliminations of possibilities rather than focusing on the best possibility. So, yeah. All right, so let's talk about the next one, unable. Well, if you're unable to do something, what might that mean? What might that mean? So what do you guys think? Is it more obstacles of, uh, you know, fact, practicality, whatever, or is it more an obstacle of a mind or give me examples for each? That could be both as well, I would think, right? Because you don't know a, until you try it. Is it a physical or a mental application? Yeah, right. So a lot of it's just going to be tied to whatever the situation at hand happens to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can certainly see that if I have to have a certain resource and I don't have it, I'm not able to do whatever it is that needs to be done. And um, when, and if I have to have some sort of knowledge or skill or technique, raw, I mean, these are practical kinds of things that I can go and address. But what if I don't have the ability to, and now give me an obstacle of the mind that might come up here, Tim? Well, uh, no, I was just going to say that for me, that is that is a competency issue um, mm -hmm. in the part not able to do it because I may not have the knowledge, skill, or ability that's required to perform that task. And so therefore that becomes an obstacle for me and that's why I'm unable to accomplish the task. Yeah, I think I think a great deal of the stuff that comes up for unable are just gonna fall into the real category. And what about people who have ADD and can't focus that? That's my thought on the obstacles of the mind kind of thing. Well, there are people who have challenges uh, when it comes to you know, problem solving, when it comes to communicating, when it comes to staying focused for, you know, in case of ADD and that. So, you know, I think there are obstacles of the mind. I don't know, hmm, how do I put it? I think that well, I'd want to break that down then and say, sometimes there are organic obstacles of the mind. And yeah. sometimes there are just kind of habituated obstacles of the mind. I think it's also physical. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of a uh, co-worker many years ago who had a young son and she was a single parent and the, the kid's father played football at the University of Florida and he was a really big guy. So that so this young boy was 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 pretty big for his age. Mm -hmm. And she took him out to the park to sign him up for Little League football. And the coach said to him, said to her rather, that he would uh, put her son on the team 
she he said but i want you to know because i don't want you to get upset he, he's not going to play in the games this is his first year uh and he weighs as much as the other boys on the team but physically he doesn't have the skill set yet he hasn't developed he doesn't know and she was fine with that until she went out and saw him take a lick one day and she pulled him out and signed him up for piano lessons <laughs> <laughs> okay well good <laughs> so so my point in that is that it could be you know a physical obstacle as well as opposed to mental yeah and i think that's it you know as we're working our way through this uh, again, we're going into real great depth of dialogue with a client if we're going to have them participate in the kind of discussion we're having right now so um so it could take a good long while to work our way through those obstacles. But honestly, I think that the long-term coaching opportunities that uh, you have waiting for you are going to be when it comes to obstacles of the mind, dealing with obstacles of the mind, describing a current situation, a desired situation. You know, these are tied to a particular situation, particular moment in time. It's a rather straightforward kind of thing. So it happens and then it's done. But when it comes to these obstacles of the mind, how long might they endure and how many of the decisions you need to make and actions you need to take might be impacted by those obstacles of the mind? Yeah, so, I think that's the higher burden, right? Because right, you, right. you can't see it. It doesn't have the tactile uh, aspect like Tim just described. And mm -hmm. so you're dealing with something that's invisible. And I think that's why people challenge a lot with the habits of the mind, because I just read about a psychologist who's, he said, you know, we, we understand a lot about the impact of daily stressors, right? And how it inhibits learning. It dramatically reduces retention of coaching, training, or education. He said, not enough study has been done on daily renewal on that kind of practice. And that's what he's focusing on now. Like I said, that's a more holistic way of not only staving off stressors, but also to be able to thrive, right, which is right, what right. people want, not just survive, but to thrive. But no yeah. one really teaches that because, again, all these internal things that you can't see, but you, you experience them at such a high level, especially when we talk about anything of the emotion, yeah. that's always better remembered than something that's neutral. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the the yeah we, we joke all the time that of all the cruises we've ever been on, the only one that we remember is the one that was absolutely horrible. <laughs> the rest have all just become a bit of a blur. So, but what you're what you're uh, alluding to, um, I think, uh, resonates with this idea that uh, change can either be transactional or transformational. Hmm. And I certainly know that when I look at medicine as an industry, certain aspects of medicine are highly transactional sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So if I um, break a leg, well, I need the leg mended. This is a transactional kind of a thing. So I'm broken, fix me. Um, or let's say that, you know, I can't see right, give me some glasses. Or I have a toothache, extract it. These are transactional kinds of things, kind of one and done sorts of things. Where I think that the more holistic look at medicine says, no, 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 there is there is this element that's really going to be on the transformational side of things, where mm -hmm. we have to be able to change people's awareness, their ability, their willingness. Um, we have to be able to, to work with those, uh, with the removal of those sorts of obstacles so that they can um, evolve into the best version of themselves they can be. Right. So um, I was, can I add something? This is yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, it was interesting when I was working at AT and T, and I we were working with uh, uh, Ulrich from University of Michigan, and he shared the seven processes of change. Mm. And after many years, I said, actually, there's eight. And mm. I said, if you do not change yourself, you cannot change other people and if you're going to say this has to change then what are you going to personally change first mm -hmm. so to me there's eight processes of change that have to occur and um, a lot of people particularly leaders in organizations think everybody else has to change but they don't yeah 
Yeah, in which case the, the system now has an anchor to the old way of doing things. Yeah, so if they want to change, they have to or want other people to change, then they have to change themselves. I agree. Yep, yep, yep. Now, who's the author for this particular program? Or um, Well, it was David Ulrich, and he and a group of uh, people had put together the seven processes of change. Yeah. I'm, in, curious, so. I'm curious to look them up and make we, maybe we can. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll share them with you. Yeah, I'd be curious to have a circle of brilliance conversation around. Yeah, this, I'll, uh, this, I'll send you what I have put together. Excellent. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, um, so all right, going back to the, uh, the obstacle thing. So there are plenty of practical obstacles of, uh, of ability. So um, if you're unable to do something, a lot of that is going to be practical. I might even say the lion's share of it is probably going to be practical um, sorts of stuff. I felt it was an opposite thing for unawareness. Most of the unawareness issues are going to fall into obstacles of the mind, not obstacles of fact, although they may be missing something concrete that needs to be there. Now, we'd still be saying then that when it comes to ability, there can be some things that are obstacles of the mind. Some of those things are organic in nature they have to be dealt with in a different kind of way than the uh, inability to use your mind in more, hmm, I want to say, I don't want to say non-organic, but where things aren't problematic, just about going through, you know, your daily world of ability, what obstacle of the mind might impact my ability to do something that is not an organic problem? Hmm. That's quite a question. Hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what I even meant by that, but I know where I'm going. <laughs> I mean, I know it's so interesting. I know the, the destination that I have in mind for that question. Can you ask it again? I'm not sure. So um, <laughs> I'm saying that there are obstacles of the mind that fall into the category of being unable to do something. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, are, are organic, like we talked about. If you've got ADD or you've got some sort of, of emotional issue, you know, if you've got pro, you know, profound depression, anxiety, whatever, these are obstacles of the mind. They're organic in nature, meaning that something go, is going on in the world of biology and that and it may very well need to be dealt with in a different way by a different professional right? Mm -hmm. Someone needs to write you a prescription for a pill uh, in many of the cases. And sometimes there's a whole lifetime of work that needs to be done. Like, um, you know, what about someone who is a highly function is highly functioning, but is on the autism spectrum? Mm -hmm. You know, they have obstacles of ability. They probably also have some gifts uh, that based on the th things I've learned about the way the mm -hmm. that operates. But nevertheless, it's an organic issue that's going to take time to really help someone uh, work their way through. That's not my my uh, it's not my wheelhouse. So I would need to acknowledge it and find someone who can help the individual with those sorts of things. So that just left me going like, yeah, well, what about the non-organic, inorganic, whatever, not, but non-organic obstacles of the mind that would be in the uh, in unable category? I yeah, see, that's where, I'm sorry, go ahead, T. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Brian. No, no, go ahead. I'll write mine down so I can remember. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to do the same. <laughs> I think that's where the, the, you know, based on just human behavior, like the neurobiology of human behavior in general, which is conditioned. So you just talked about transactional versus transformational change. And I think we have some things that are manufactured based on our conditioning and some things that, um, you know, are organic. So some of these behavioral aspects, what we've seen um, when we tested them in a lab is like, okay, well, where did this come from? Well, this has been it built on some of these experiences um, that is just it, like it's manufactured. There's no evidence that that's what it has to be other than something that one experienced. Right. right. And, and what they put a thought process around and just stuck with it. So when it comes to a challenge is when someone um, says, well, well, that's your opinion. I've seen this a lot when we were testing this in like religion, 
and someone would say like their pastor said something and that's that was the basis of that thought process because this authority person said it mm -hmm. and so when the researcher told him well your pastor has an opinion but does that make it true they were threatened by that because oh my pastor is you know he's a god-fearing man and this kind of a thing and we said okay we're not challenging that we just simply mean you know asking could there be other possibilities and they couldn't let go of that like mm -hmm. it was that kind that that's extreme that was manufactured mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i think that's what i would came to my mind is this idea that you can manufacture some of these things in which case they are obstacles of the mind but not tied back to some organic issue to the person right Right. right. That's what I was trying, just trying to figure out. It's like, well, if I said, um, okay, if I'm at the, if I'm seeing someone at the gym and they look at an amount of weight to move and they say, I can't move that. Well, there is a belief there that is an obstacle of the mind that Paul is, is them saying, I don't possess the ability. It's possible that they're wrong. They haven't put it to the test. They don't really know that they have that ability. Does that then move that into the unawareness uh, thing? They are unaware that they are as strong as they are. Now, we'll yeah. never explain this to any client. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, I was thinking while Brian was talking, you were just talking, reminds me of several things. One of them is human trafficking because Rotary is working very diligently in that. And, um, I think those who have gone through that, it's it's um, it's a trauma. I think of the movie Sully. You know those people who have gone through that, those trauma or uh, life experiences. It's difficult. They say we I can't get over it, but you can get over it. But it's an obstacle of the mind. Mm -hmm. um, I think of and I and I could have this person wrong because I'm not always good on names, etc. But I think of Little Richie. Isn't he the one that was blind and was a really good singer? Who was? Oh that? yeah, 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 no, yeah, Little yeah. Richard. And they couldn't figure out why he was blind, but he was. Um, but they it, it, they don't they, they said physically. I I I think this is true. I think they said physically he doesn't he shouldn't be blind, but he is. And I think of the advertisements on Golo. You know, I am a hundred. I was. I lost 110 pounds. I've never been able to do. I tried everything. Yada yada yada. Until I tried Golo. Well, I think those are obstacles of the mind that they work through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're not. They're not organic. Right. They're not organic. It's just <laughs> because they hold this belief. Yes. That they cannot, should not, would not, whatever they are almost willingly participating in the um um what's the diminishment is that a word diminution of their actual abilities their actual personal truth but that also gets into perhaps unable until they can really become aware yeah so i think it would that would certainly bring back to is their lack of ability begin uh, as part of it an, an unawareness Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, T. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, I want to dive into an area that um, Brian can definitely speak to. I was watching a podcast with um, Andrew Huberman. That's a, he's a neuroscientist. And he was talking about how people that are some people, some of the population of people diagnosed with ADHD or self-diagnosed or just believe that they have it isn't really accurate as much as it is they are inundated with an overwhelming amount of dopamine from social media, which is having a, having a, having that a effect on them. I've heard and, that. Yeah. and so I find that to be interesting as we're talking about uh, talking about the mind as far as, as far as awareness. So um, are you familiar with that, Brian? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And he's spot on and that's the trick of the mind, right? Cause, and that's why, again, when you're seeing this stuff, hearing this stuff, over and over again, it becomes true, whether it's validated or not. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we never really filter it for uh, relevancy, for uh, the truth of it. And so the mind doesn't have filters for that. Those are things that when we talk about creating meaning and satisfaction, these kinds of things, you're cultivating that 
daily through your choices, through decisions. That's the power of this technology, it, I think, is reshaping people's minds to think like you have to be conditioned a certain way. Mm -hmm. I see this now, uh, you know, with the younger population in particular, that they don't want to think for themselves. They don't have to. So they'll Google or chat GPT something and just like, ah, oh, I got it done quicker. It's like, yeah, but what was the real benefit of that for you? Like what value did it actually create for yourself? And how can you even build on that value? They have trouble answering that question. It's like I just asked a trick question. Mm, no, it's ex exactly right. Just because technology can do something doesn't mean that uh, that was the only the, you know reason to do it yourself. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, T, I have a question just based on like what Chris is just asking. With all of these, and you talk about this idea, and I love what you say, how you help people remove the barriers. Yeah. I think there'll be self-induced barriers to all of these, would you say, not Like some things that you manufacture, even with suitableness, like how do you know if something is suitable for you unless you actually try it? How do you know what you know the willingness threshold is unless you try it? No, I right? think so, well, you, you've actually landed at where this call was going to ultimately <laughs> get to, and that is that in all of these cases, unaware, unable, unwilling, and unsuitable, there are aspects of it that fall into uh, um, obstacles of reality versus obstacles of the mind. So the question was going to be, where's the preponderance of the um, of the example is going to be. And so that's why I said when it came to an awareness, it was more about the mind, where unable was going to be more about practical stuff. So when we get to unwilling, it'll be interesting. Is our most unwillingness issues more about obstacles of the mind or obstacles of reality? So, yeah. And bottom line, it was just, I was saying like, you know, you can ask people over here in our description, the reason why you're not where you want to be is because there is some obstacle or set of obstacles, real or imagined, that are in your way. Well, I mean, we could just ask people some general things, but I don't think I can say to them, and what should, which of these obstacles are just obstacles you're making up? <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I got to be a little more more savvy than that, you know, a little more clever than that, because they, they don't realize they're doing it. I'm, I'm convinced that people are not aware of the obstacles of the mind that they've put in place themselves. So, so this progression yeah. shows like an order of things from the white, green, black, yellow, and red. But could we make the case that sometimes if we're the, a, a case to start with the black in terms of understanding hmm. these four uns and then maybe that will give more clues to the current situation does that make yeah, sense yeah it could well it could very well uh, i think well, what i'll draw to your attention is that when we are doing this path of self discovery we are inserting an imposed structure on a process that is happening continuously and so what i want to mean by that is that at all times every day your brain is in one of these modes at any given second in time, and the next second would be somewhere else. So we're constantly living our life, which might involve jumbling up on things going on. I might be just dealing with an obstacle. Oh, look what's happening. Oh, look what I discovered. discovered. You know, so we're out there to prune the roses and notice that the lantana is coming up. So, you know, it's just, you know, this all happens randomly. The path of self-discovery gets pulled into play whenever you reach a point where you say, I need to make a decision and I want it to be a good decision. I want it to be the right decision. When the uh, question becomes, how do we go about approaching and understanding a situation uh, sufficiently that I can make a reliable um change or reliable decision to change in a really efficient way so that's what this structure is designed to do so okay get you that got it at the self-discovery but that means that every time the path is you decide to use the path something came before it so wow. i would say to you that we can look at each one of these colors and say how might something be going on in someone's life that then triggered an opportunity to walk the path. So did they stumble across something in their current situation and suddenly they decided they needed to make a decision? I could probably come up with a bunch of those. Certainly if there's something they want, 
to be different. So the green uh, step was kind of just where they happy people. Oh, we got to make a decision because, oh, I'd like to go on whatever excursion. So, so I can see how that could do it. I can certainly see to your point that I might become very aware of an obstacle that's in my way. Um, in a very disruptive kind of manner, you know, obstacles of particularly obstacles of fact are there, and you know, you could turn the corner and suddenly, oh, there it is, you know, there's the obstacle. Yeah. So, so it can certainly trigger an opportunity for you to walk the path to get to better clarity, better decisions. Once you start getting up to the solution, you're kind of kind of past that. This is where we're turning the corner and saying, like, rather than understanding the situation, I want to start treating it. But nevertheless, it may very well be that someone was already in the midst of employing a solution of some sort, and the solution wasn't really working. Uh, that may trigger them to say, well, then we need to walk the path to get to the right answer. And I'll share with you for this. Uh, you guys know that um, I take an SNRI for my um, my endogenous depression and that. And I can tell you, it's not the first medication they put me on, right? I mean, it's this has been going on my entire life. And so you can imagine, well, I had a current situation. I was depressed. I had a desired situation. I didn't want to be depressed. Uh, I had an obstacle. I either didn't have a medication or I uh, still wasn't going to So what they do, they change the solution. They say, well, try this, try this, try this. Well, until something actually worked, you can see how you might cycle through these other three multiple times because something in the solution uh, triggered an, an opportunity to walk through this again to get to greater detail, depth, et cetera. I wow. guess just to finish it off, if you've got someone who's coming into you and they're just a bundle of feelings, instincts, intuition, intuitions, and it's all just spewing out in every direction, like a Pollock painting or something like that, well, that could definitely trigger someone to who would, no, I'm going to say <clears> that. It would be great if that would trigger someone to walk the path but in all likelihood, the feelings, instinct, intuitions that they're having may very well be um, what they have to manage before they can even get to this point. I guess I'm saying that because mm -hmm. if I'm all bundled up by anger and resentment and all those very upgrade sorts of sorts of emotions, fear and all that, I'm, I'm in no position to, in my own head to say, I need to walk the path. I might be too upgrade to be what even be able to tap into that. Uh, or I could be so far downgrade. I just plain don't care. Right. right. So, so take question for you. So when's the most appropriate time to, to start considering or factoring in the Dunning Kruger effect? Is it post grid or is it during this time here? Well, I can see where it could fit both. Do you have a thought about it? I was thinking possibly post grid because it presents more of that visual evidence of something may not plotting where it's appropriate for them. And then you can have that conversation of if they're overestimating or underestimating a task mm -hmm. versus I think it could provide a roadblock if you do it during the path, because it might go. I don't know, depending upon how much time you're expecting, like you talked about 90 minutes. So if, you, if you're probably having a 90 minute conversation, I, I would say post grid, but if you're trying to really get granular, um, maybe having those conversations here in the path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, the only thing I'm thinking about that is that from what I remember about the Dunning-Kruger effect, it had to do with people having some sort of a uh, a belief about their ability or whatever being very low. Um, yeah. 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 So I can see how it might, I guess I'm, I'm just thinking that it may very well come up that they're talking about that low ability to do something from the early, uh, from the earliest stages of the conversation. In which case, would you apply the technique or would you just accept it as information coming to you? I probably would just accept it until we, until post grade, because post grade, you get to see how it shows up on a number of activities. Right. And to see if it's something that you get to, I guess, identify what's the value of really um, helping on that task as far as priority. 
Um, no, does no. it play a big role? Is it is it a major obstacle in the ultimate objectives? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, see, I guess I'm also thinking it might come up when we are doing the action planning with them and supporting them as they're going about implementing the action. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That could give rise to another change grid. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, the rest of you that are on the call, uh, are you all familiar with the, with Dunning Kruger, or should we give you a quick little glimpse? I, I, this is Tim. I I think it's post. Um, you know, yeah. to the way Chris posed the question, uh, mm -hmm. because it wouldn't be until after um, one goes through this process that we're able to help them understand. Like for instance, I'm seeing uh, someone who may be under the, the Dunning-Kruger effect as being uh, far out grid and probably even, maybe even closer to the uh, the danger zone yeah. because they've overestimated their ability, right? And yeah. so walking them through through this exercise would then help them understand how much they may have overestimated their ability. Right, and so go ahead, T. I don't know who, uh, even how to spell it. Oh, it's <laughs> Dunning, yeah, D-U-N-N-I-N-G uh, hyphen Kruger, K-R-U or U-E, K-R-U-G-E-R, -E I think it's correct. Yeah, I think. And what it boils down to is that the, it's a, one of the cognitive biases where someone who believes that, um, they have a level of ability to do something that is greater than what their actual ability is. So I think the way they frame it is that it says, when a person of low ability uh, to expertise, knowledge, whatever it happens to be, um, somehow or another convinces themselves or holds the belief that their level of ability is actually greater than it truly is. Almost like the Peter Principle. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, 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 kind of, kind of. I think the Peter principle is even affects now other people kind of bestowing it on you. But now that I'm saying that, I wonder how many people with a Dunning-Kruger situation actually got that situation because people kept telling them that they were better than they really were. Mm -hmm. You know, was it conditioned to end up with this bias? Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine, I imagine both, most biases are, uh, are conditioned. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's post. I, I'm starting to think it's post as well because of the conditioning. So in other words, you the, the going through the change grid process, you develop some awareness to where now you can see. Like we're asking questions now about uh, longevity and, and different uh, lifespan, health span questions and different demographics. And right. what's always interesting to me is how the older demographics seem to be uh, more challenged, but when you look at it, they're older, right? So these people are 65 and older and feel like change is virtually impossible at this point for them. We're trying to explain, no, it isn't, right? The younger dem de demographic, they're more like, yeah, this is definitely possible. And I can see this technology and they want you know, have 50, 20 different uh, wearables that they're tracking different things with. So it's just interesting in seeing these kinds of dynamics in terms of unawareness, even demographically, mm -hmm. and what they've experienced. But when we present it in a way about, you know, your cells can regenerate themselves and how you can get older, but aging is an actual biological process that you can participate in and take control of then that shifts their uh, sense of awareness and they'll be more willing to participate in that. So now we're going to start testing that out in terms of the efficacy and personal sustainability. Excellent. Now, Brian, to, to your your point, and I think it was also some of the Tim, Tim was mentioning, people that are experiencing this Dunning-Kruger effect, where do they end up presenting themselves on the change grid? Well, we know they tend to present their ability. We, we know they present their ability or believe their ability is higher than it really is. So let's just take that up to the highest levels for now. So they think they're a nine, a 10, and an 11. 
I promise you in the world of Dunning-Kruger, we're not worried about a two believing they're a three. That's probably a good thing for them to be having a little bit greater belief in themselves. But we're talking about people who are up here with a rather, with a rather severely distorted uh, concept of what their ability really is to, for that. So how they're going to present themselves is really tied to the level of challenge that they uh, believe they're up against. So they might believe they have great ability, but great ability to meet what level of challenge? Mm. So certainly someone who is a Dunning-Kruger uh, bias and they are in a very difficult situation, they're going to end up carrying themselves, presenting themselves as a driven driver, but they're not qualified to be a driven driver. So, mm. you know, can you guys, kind of hear that bad stuff's going to happen. There's going to be a mess to clean up. You know, mm. we might need to go in there and rescue them. They're going to step into harm's way. We're going to have to bring them back to safety. So there's an intervention that may very well have to happen here. Um, also, I can certainly see how if I think I've got a great ability to do something and I think it's a very low level of challenge, a menial kind of a task, I can certainly uh, see how I would present myself as this you know, deep down in apathy kind of person. I don't care about it. It doesn't need to get done, blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, they overestimate the level of control they have on that situation and there's a bill to be paid for that. So if the two extremes are true, we can certainly say there's a continuum there as well. So you might have people that are trying out there to tell you that it's just the truth. It's just you can count on it, blah, blah, blah. But they overestimate their ability. They overestimate the quality of the, the truth they hold so dear. And so they can end up being very persuasive, although persuasion is really up here, but very, very um, persuasive in terms of what an analytical uses to persuade. Very, yeah, whatever. They can throw all kinds of so-called facts and figures at you that may not actually be facts or figures. Mm -hmm. And again, the people that are downgrade down here in the uh, driven uh, analytical uh, space on that, well, they would just be telling everybody that they need to be focusing on this. Again, this is the reformer energy, power apathy. I don't want to do it, but someone else probably should look at it. So that that's what they're basically saying. They're, they're still saying X is true and I've got the ability to do it, but how willing am I to step up and actually do it is tied to the level of challenge. Was that a lot? Was that just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So question for you. So when we look at that perception of somebody perceiving themselves, perceiving their ability is higher, it's one thing, but the other thought I'm having is where would it live on a change grid? And I'm thinking that that Dunning-Kruger effect comes into play anytime. Would it? So here's my question to you. Would it come into play anytime challenge is greater than ability is where it would actually live versus from versus how a person perceives where they are? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, I can certainly say that there are going to be certain hmm, diagnoses that are going to be very aligned with Dunning-Kruger. So mm -hmm. when I think of a narcissist, I certainly think that a narcissist has some element of this Dunning-Kruger bias uh, in play. Obviously, they, they think they're super, super great and blah, blah, blah. And so they're not, they're not a superhero. They're not all that. So I, I can kind of hear that they might be out there. Um, I think that a lot of people might use the Dunning-Kruger bias as a defense mechanism when they feel like they're under threat, being questioned, doubted, whatever. So maybe that's more of an upgrade kind of thing because you're feeling more and more out of control. So you present yourself as having a higher level of ability. I don't even know if that's technically Dunning-Kruger or if that's just a defense mechanism. Or, or charm. Or charm, there you go, there you go. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there that, uh, think they're a heck of a lot charming than they're charming than they really are <laughs> so. i like what tim puts in the chat there um i think relates to this because they said they accurately uh they can't accurately judge their own competence because they lack the metacognition mm -hmm. the ability to step back and examine oneself objectively see that's a practice you know like a lot of this perceived ability is really really high something that i learned about the neurochemicals that are present there and mastery is when people assume 
that that's finality, right? Mm -hmm. So like you close the door on learning at that point. So when we talk about acetylcholine and those kinds of neurochemicals, that that's adaptive. There is no finality to that. And so when you think, oh, I have this high intelligence, I'm done, I don't have to learn anymore, you're limiting yourself significantly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why, Brian, I was saying I can see that individual going, you know, out grid and even to a threatening level or degree. Interesting, interesting. Because uh, they're unaware. They're unaware of the fact that there is some stuff that they just don't know about. And and they are feeling that their their uh, level of awareness or their knowledge, their ability is it far supersedes uh, the requirements of the task. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're hurting themselves in these internal uh, mechanisms it's the same way a person who's not physically capable, you know, go out and try to run a marathon or something like that and injure themselves because they haven't been adequately prepared. We can do the same thing internally. Mm -hmm. So when we create these false narratives about our own intelligence, because again, the one thing neuroplasticity needs is alertness, focus, and intensity. And that develops in your sleep. So this idea where acetylcholine comes in, that would be the alertness for you because it'll put the spotlight on exactly what you need to learn but you have to be willing, you have to be open to that learning. You can't presume I got it. That's why I hate in business when I hear people say things like, this is best practices. Well, guess what? The evidence of your best practices isn't working and it presumes finality when it isn't. Right. Mm -hmm. The evidence shows that it isn't working. So you need to level up or you know upgrade your best practices. Well, and this shows up a lot in the room, uh, particularly uh, and on the learning and development side, when you're talking about soft skills development mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the resistance in the room, um, you know, it's just so high uh, that you have to really work hard to get folks engaged because uh, there is this perception, the DK is in full effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think I think you're absolutely right that um, what you're describing is a situation where the person is unaware of the fact that their assessment is not correct, and mm. that apparently is an essential element of the Dunning Kruger effect. Because I I just looked up if there is a relationship between decay and um, narcissism, and Dunning actually refuted the relationship stating that while individuals with narcissism tend to overestimate, they are not insensitive to their incapability. Mm. So they're aware that they're, you know, because uh, they're frightened by something. There's an insecurity that's driving there. So they they definitely hold the belief that they are not the things, but they have to uh, present themselves as those things, uh, you know, to kind of get their thing. Where they said people that are really un having the uh, the Dunning Kruger effect, they genuinely believe uh, that. Oh, T, that's really interesting because you caused me to recall one of my uh, diversity courses uh, with a client, and I think you're you're right there in terms of that fear. And for me in the DE and I space, it is that it's an obstacle based on fear and the fear is that their values and beliefs are going to be challenged mm -hmm. and i can clearly recall a guy very angrily saying to me um you're not going to change what i believe you know oh. and i believe what i believe so to brian's point about openness uh the willingness to learn something different or new mm -hmm. he was in full resistance to yes and 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 he expressed that in a very angrily way, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so that's part of 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 that resistance. So for him, uh, it was a really really strong obstacle because it was pushing and challenging him around what he thought and believed to be true. Interesting. You know what Tim just brought? I think it was Tim who just brought up. Um, Reminds me of Marilee Goldberg Adams' work in the whole area of questioning, 
-hmm. because we have a judger mindset and a learner mindset. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we go down into the judger mindset, but you can, you can get off of that path through a new question. But some people just, you know, and you have to go down into pity city sometimes because it's a little bit of self-preservation, mm -hmm. but she sure can't stay there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's where that judger mindset, that whole, you know, there are two mindsets. And I think an obstacle is it is that people are unwilling to get out of there, unable, yep. and um, and and unaware that mm -hmm. they're even there. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and oh. that's where the work begins for us. I mean, that's that's where we're hopefully one way or another we're able to help the person see things as they really are and decide and do whatever needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay, well, we're at the top of the hour, so uh, let's plan on picking up where we left off, just in case I forget, because that happens to me sometimes. Um, I want to talk about, did I just close? I closed the one I wanted. We need to finish up the black step on the on the four uns before we get into the solutions piece, because there's quite, an, quite a, um, a debate I'd like to facilitate with you guys about the yellow step. So with that, uh, thanks all very much for joining in and look forward to having you the next time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.